You should have read a little bit about um, intervals and what the definition of an interval is, what's the difference between a closed interval and an open interval, an infinite interval, and so forth. Which brings us to the nested interval prop intervals property. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take a set of intervals, and they're going to be nested, which means that each new interval is a subset of the previous interval. Okay, And we're going to denote them i sub n, which is the interval from the closed interval from a sub n to b sub n. So it's a nested sequence of closed bounded intervals. Okay, the an infinite interval, excuse me, an infinite interval can be bound or can be closed, but it's not bounded. If we have a sequence of nested closed bounded intervals, then there is a number z, that's what this symbol is, xi, such that z is in every single one of these intervals. So let's get a quick picture of what this is really looking like. So here, maybe my first interval. So a sub 1 to b sub 1. Now, i sub 2 is an interval that's contained within this guy. So maybe it goes from here to there. So there's b2, there's a2. So A2. Um, B3. Maybe B3 is exactly the same as B2. So I'll write that up there. And A3 maybe there. And just for kicks, let's do one more. Maybe we have A sub 4 here and B sub 4 there. And we want the interval in between. Okay, so you see how the intervals keep getting smaller and smaller in this particular case. I never colored in those other ones there, did I? So that's there, that's there. Okay, so what's the point here? Well, the point is um, we're going to prove this, and I want to sh illustrate some things before we get into the proof. First of all, notice that b sub 1 is going to be greater than or equal to all of the a's. The first endpoint is going to be greater than or equal to all of the left-hand endpoints. Okay. Moreover, actually, you give me any right-hand endpoint, and it's going to be greater than or equal to all of these guys. We're going to kind of prove these as we go. Okay. So first of all, we're going to look at um, this fact. You give me any i sub n, it's always going to be a subset of i sub 1. So Here's my first subinterval. That's the black one. You give me any um, other interval in the sequence, and it's going to be a subset of that. Well, this is b sub 1. Here is a sub n. a sub n is always to the left of that. Now, why do we care about that? Well, that means that b sub 1 will serve as an upper bound for the set of all left-hand endpoints. That's important because if there is an upper bound, then that means that it has a least upper bound. Okay, so we're going to look, we're going to call, um, we'll call the least upper bound, the supremum that is, z. Okay, well because z is the supremum of all of these numbers, by the definition of supremum, z is greater than or equal to every single left-hand endpoint. Now I've highlighted that in red because we're going to come to back, back to that later. Now I made a second point. B sub n, the right-hand endpoint of any of these intervals, will also be an upper bound for these guys, all of the left-hand endpoints. We'll look at a couple of pictures to illustrate this. We do this in cases. If n is less than or equal to k, that means that i sub k is further down the list of my nested intervals, which means it is a subset of i sub n. So let's draw that out. So here is i sub n, i sub k is going to sit within that set, i sub k. Sorry about that. Okay, um, so we need to establish that a sub k is less than or equal to b sub n. Well, where is a sub k? There's a sub k. There's b sub n right there. Certainly, it's going to be less than or equal to b sub n because it's less than or equal to b sub k. 
and b sub k is less than or equal to b sub n. On the other hand, if n is greater than or equal to k, then i sub n is a subset of i sub k. So a sub n, or i sub n, is further down the list of my nested subintervals. So here's i sub k, i sub n is in here. Now I want to prove that b sub n is greater than or equal to all the left-hand endpoints. Well, this is a sub k, this is a sub n, this is b sub n. So notice that a sub k is less than or equal to a sub n, which is less than or equal to b sub n. So we have just established that b sub n is an upper bound for this set. Well, because b sub n is an upper bound, by the definition of upper bound, upper bounds are greater than or equal to the supremums. And z was the supremum. And lo and behold, we have magic. Because z is greater than or equal to a sub n, z is also less than or equal to b sub n. Putting this into one statement, we have a sub n is less than or equal to z, which is less than or equal to b sub n. And what is i sub n? i sub n is precisely the interval from a n to bn, which means that z lies somewhere in there. That's my best z that I can draw. Well, now we're going to look at an application of this, and it has to do with decimal expansions. So I want to find the decimal expansion for 3 elevenths. And I want you to think about this in a slightly different way than you've probably ever thought about decimal expansions before. What we're going to do is we're going to take the interval from 0 to 1. Now I wanted to use the same real number line over and over again, so I'm going to put the decimal points in here, but this is the number 1. I know that 3 elevenths is somewhere between 0 and 1. Now I didn't write this in, but 3 elevenths is in the interval from 0 to 1, and I'm going to call the, this guy i sub 1. This is my very first interval. Okay, well now I want to locate 3 elevenths. I can't really do this without the use of a calculator, but it turns out it's got to be somewhere, right? It's somewhere right about in there. In particular, it's between 0.2 and 0.3. Okay, so that's going to be my second, sub, uh, second interval in the nested sequence. 3 elevenths is in there, and I'm going to call this i sub 2. Well, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this interval and not treat it as the interval from 0 to 1 now, but treat it as this new interval. So this is actually 0.2 here. This is 0.3, which means this is 0.21, and this is 0 0.22, 0 0.23, 0 0.24, and I'll let you finish them at the rest off. But what we've essentially done is we've taken our original interval from 0 huh, from, there's 1, from 0 to 1. I broke it up into f uh, 10 pieces. That's a lousy 10 pieces. But this is interval 0, this is interval 1, this is interval 2, this is interval 3 and 4, and so on. And then what I'm going to do is if my number lands in a particular interval, we landed in that interval, that's going to be the decimal point for my expansion. So 3 elevenths is going to start off 0.2. Well, now I've taken this interval and blown it up. So this interval here, that endpoint corresponds to that. This endpoint corresponds here. And now I want to know where it lies. Well, it turns out to lie somewhere about there. So there's my 3 elevenths again. So now 3 elevenths is between 0.27 and 0.28. That's going to be I3. I can continue to do this process. So this is 0.27 to 0.28. So this is 0.271. Not easy to write. 0.272, and so on, all the way down the line. Okay, where is 3 elevenths again? Well, it's right about there actually. I keep zooming in, and this nested sequence of intervals will always contain 3 elevenths, and we can then, after we've played around with this enough, make the guess that 3 elevenths is 0 0.272727. 27. So it's a slightly different way of viewing um, 
uh, what we call the decimal expansions for rational numbers. But it's an interesting way to view it as taking these little pieces, numbering them, and then whatever number our rational number or whatever number we're dealing with actually falls in, that's the decimal value for that particular position in the expansion of that number.